Well, uh, hello everybody and welcome to this uh, session in the Region in, uh, Regions in Recovery e-Festival. Uh, my name is Dr. Michael Glass uh, from the University of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. And I'm pleased to be joined uh, by my uh, noir colleague, Jen Nowitz from Oxford Brooks University, who's going to be uh, the featured speaker today. And she uh, tells us uh, more about exploring the dynamic interaction between infrastructure and regional governance in metropolitan New York. We're also joined uh, by a number of, of speakers who'll be responding to Jen's talk uh, in due course. Uh, before we get uh, to the main event, though, uh, let me just uh, dominate uh, the proceedings for a couple of minutes by explaining uh, who we are and what we are all about. So the Network on uh, Infrastructural Regionalism has been in operation since uh, about 2018, funded with the generous support of the Regional Studies Association. Uh, what we are doing uh, through an international and uh, hopefully fairly uh, horizontal collaboration is to be thinking about how to move the infrastructure turn uh, into the direction of regionalism, uh, how are regions constructed through and by infrastructures, and how are infrastructures shaping uh, those regions. Uh, we do this in a number of different ways. Uh, the paper that came out uh, in 2020 uh, that is available uh, without uh, pay more uh, through our, uh, regional studies, regional science, uh, goes through our, our agenda and uh, showcases four different elements uh, to the work that we're attempting to do. The first of it is to bring together uh, perspectives from a number of disciplinary perspectives in order to understand these questions of regional construction through infrastructure. And not only are we talking with our fellow scholars, uh, but we're also talking with practitioners and policymakers, those people at the coalface, uh, who are shaping regional futures through infrastructure. We're also interested in questions of both formal and informal governance, thinking about the ways in which um, infrastructure is uh, managed and mediated and is uh, constructed through different uh, soft and formal uh, mechanisms. We're also interested in uh, regional futures and what it means to see like a region infrastructurally. So who is responsible for the construction of uh, regional imaginaries? Uh, what does it mean to see like a region through infrastructure? And how is that shaped um, through the imaginaries that are created through both material and discursive practices? Finally, uh, none of us can survive without infrastructure. These are critical systems. And so we want to think about the regional implications of infrastructure for people that are living uh, across space. What are the everyday experiences that are constructed through regional infrastructure? And how are the mediations of global flows and lived experiences um, realized? Uh, this isn't just a top-down perspective, but it's also bottom-up and thinking about those individuals that are, are engaging in the construction of a region. Now, if that sounds exhausting, it's because it is. And we've uh, got a lot of work products that you can have a look at to see um, how this is uh, being uh, activated. One of the things, uh, in addition to that RSRS paper that I mentioned, is also a, a virtual special issue that came out a couple of years ago in regional studies, where we showcase the last 50 years of engagement with infrastructure through uh, the Regional Studies Association's flagship journal. Uh, in addition to that, there are some things in the pipeline that uh, we're, we're all too uh, pleased for you to look at uh, when, when they're released. Uh, that includes a special issue in territory politics and governance on uh, water infrastructure and uh, regional governance, and also uh, some forthcoming titles uh, that are a little bit further out. But um, we do want to acknowledge uh, the generous support of the uh, Research Network Grant Scheme uh, uh, that's uh, provided by the Regional Studies Association. It's through that generous support that all of the work that we've been engaged in over the last couple of years was able to be uh, developed. Uh, we encourage you all, as you think about your own networks and your own interests, to apply for that scheme uh, because it does provide an excellent platform uh, to, to really further uh, global regional scholarship. So give it a crack. But now let us turn over to the main event and we have a number of uh, great speakers to hear from. Uh, first and foremost, uh, we have uh, Dr. Jen Nellis from Oxford uh, Brooks University. She's gonna kick things off with her perspective 
uh, on uh, 100 years of infrastructural regionalism uh, with her perspective on uh, New York and New Jersey ports. After that, we will um, shift over to three uh, discussants who we'll hear from in turn, uh, Professor Julie Sedell from University of Illinois, uh, John Harrison from the University of Loughborough, and Marcus Hess from the University of Luxembourg. So after that, um, uh, uh, Professor Nellis will uh, respond to the respondents, uh, but in the meantime, uh, we will then be moving to uh, question and answer period. So we invite all of you uh, through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. As your questions start to be formulated, please include those in the chat, and I will be back at the end of the, uh, the time uh, to moderate that question and answer period. But without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to my colleague, uh, Jen, for her presentation on 100 years of infrastructural regionalism. Jen, please take it away. We can full see screen. the slide view. It's not yet in the full screen view. There you go. Ooh, and there's a fancy animation playing for you. Awesome. Um, all right, thank you for that introduction, Michael. Thanks everyone for joining in person. And also uh, thanks to those viewers potentially from the future who may have stumbled across this and decided that they wanted to know what, what the what about 100 years of infrastructural regionalism in New York. Um, on Twitter last night, I rather ambitiously promised shenanigans. So let's see, let's hope that I can deliver on that today. Um, so this talk focuses on, so Noir does a couple of different themes. Michael just presented it. This talk focuses on the aspect that we haven't really done a lot on recently um, or to this point, which is, but my favorite topic, um, which is infrastructural regionalism and governance. Um, so I'm not gonna dwell with this crowd on why regionalism is important. Um, you guys all know the deal and I'm preaching to the choir, but obviously sort of regional structures are important mechanisms to deal with externalities, leverage economies of scale, report, uh, respond to mandates from other levels of government, enhance competitive, address spatial inequalities and a bunch of other things. Yay, regionalism. Um, these things are really especially important in really complicated regions. So uh, you've got a kind of bad map in the background there of the New York metropolitan region, which is one of the most complex metro areas in the United States, partly because it extends into four states. There are about a zillion local governments. Um, 40 of those are large enough to be considered principal cities, which is a complicates things enormously. And there are countless authorities involved in infrastructure governance. Um, I think it's probably fair to say that if regional infrastructure didn't exist, New York would probably never existed um, in the way that we know it, and certainly not in this, well, definitely vastly imperfect form. It's undoubtedly globally significant, and partly that is because of, of this sort of, of its, its vast network of, infrastructure, of regional infrastructure. <clears throat> Anyway, once you accept the principle that regional infrastructure is important, you have to grapple with a series of realities that make life complicated in general, but make our job as scholars uh, a lot more fun. So here we go. Like infrastructure is messy. It's just so messy, um, especially at the regional scale, rarely governed within neat boundaries. Um, so many scales involved. They overlap. They're irregular. They're contested. Is there a right scale? No, no, there isn't. Um, I mean, maybe some people would think that, but there's just, it's just a, a tough question. Um, it requires multi level coordination. Um, and all of this creates tensions between infrastructures, between scales, between constituencies, between interests, all of that, um, and particularly in institutional design. Um, so, while we're increasingly, I think, as a field, acknowledging that the context in which regional infrastructure planning and management occurs um, has changed significantly over time, and there's lots of great scholarship on that, um, it, generally we're thinking that it's become more complex. Uh, the roles of centralized actors and top-down planning has diminished. Um, government has become one of many voices that is involved or should be involved in infrastructure planning. Um, but you know, as much as we we acknowledge all of this and and we're we're down with it, we spend a lot of time, still spend a lot of time debating the merits of different institutional forms. Um, so as soon as anybody agrees that there should be some sort of regional solution to something, um, the question of what the structure should look like comes up. Should it be formal or informal? Who should be included uh, or excluded? How decisions 
how should decisions be made? How should they be structured? What kinds of representation should be included? Um, how do you manage power imbalances? What powers and authority should these things have? <clears throat> um, so I think it's fair to say that we've collectively as a field kind of moved beyond the institutional fix to regional infrastructure in the sense of searching for the perfect form of all purpose regional government, um, that sort of a thing in the past. Our obsession with institutional forms is alive and well. Um, and we're very opinionated as a group, as it turns out. There are utopians who don't think it's worth doing anything regional unless what emerges is perfect. Um, there are those that prefer fragmentation and coordination versus those that want unity uh, and to bring sort of order to chaos. Uh, different strands of research prioritize different aspects of institutional design. So whether that is, and practice also uh, prioritizes different aspects of this institutional design. So whether that's accountability, effectiveness, representation, transparency, or anything else. Um, but most of us recognize that designing the institutions that govern regional infrastructure entails a series of trade-offs. Um, and so here are a couple of them. It's cert they're certainly not exist uh, exhaustive. Um, institutions can be formal versus informal. Um, the focus can be very narrow and bureaucratic uh, and technical uh, versus a sort of multi-purpose. Uh, accountability and representation can be direct or delegated. Um, decision making can be consensus based or based on votes of some sort. And there are like about 17 million different ways of balancing power in a voting system. Um, authority can be soft or hard so that, you know, decisions can be, uh, collective decisions can be uh, binding <clears throat> and like legally binding, uh, or they can just be suggestions uh, or fiscal autonomy. Uh, can be low uh, where they don't, the organization or the structure doesn't have much in the way of resources or they might have lots of resources. Um, and the nature of those resources and how they flow entails certain power structures as well. Um, bound up in all of this is an assumption that different models have different balances of political control versus outcomes. So there are institutional designs that emphasize effectiveness. So the ability to get stuff done by reducing them to sort of as apolitical a structure as possible. possible. So technical data-driven professional type organizations. Um, this is sort of in the field of, uh, as Tomas would say, output legitimacy. And there are others that privilege other things such as representation, transparency, et cetera. That's in the realm of input legitimacy. Obviously this is a vast simplification, um, but one that comes up for me again and again as a scholar uh, that's focused on voluntary collab collaboration generally. Um, so my career has been mostly about sort of intermunicipal cooperation, horizontal forms of collaboration um, is sort of in the absence of overarching structures. Um, but you know, in that realm, I've heard over and over and over and over again, it's exhausting that it doesn't count unless it has teeth, unless whatever emerges has real power. Um, so may, like maybe I come at this with like a little bit of a chip on my shoulder, um, uh, but as fate would have it, and this is how life is funny, um, I have had the opportunity for the past, you know, three, four years to study in very great detail one of the most powerful and toothy organizations on the planet that does regional infrastructure. Um, it's the OG, the Port Authority of New York and New Jersey. And now I can confidently say um, that teeth are overrated, that formal power is somewhat overrated, or at least like, if, if that's like too provocative, that it's really complicated. Um, so yeah, wrote a book. Uh, this is coming out in 2023 from the University of Michigan Press. Um, it's called Mobilizing the Metropolis uh, with my co-author, Phil Plotch, who's done amazing work on other New York infrastructure as well. Uh, he's wrote, written a book on the Tappan Zee Bridge, the Second Avenue Subway, and now obviously this is his best work with me. Um, yeah, Mobilizing the Metropolis, we're psyched about that title. Uh, something, something regional infrastructure, something, something Port Authority of New York and New Jersey is what we've got currently as the subtitle for this. So this is an audience participation round. Uh, we need a subtitle <laughs> to this book. So if you have any great ideas, fire them in the chat. Um, and yeah, you might, you might get to name our book. 
Um, I should also mention that we did this uh, book with uh, an, initially Jim Doig, who wrote an amazing book on the Port Authority uh, called Empire on the Hudson, uh, who unfortunately passed away before we got too far into the project. So <clears throat> he's with us in spirit today. Hopefully I'm not embarrassing him. Um, anyway, so I, so I wrote this book, we wrote this book <clears throat> on the Port, Port Authority of New York uh, and New Jersey. So the Port Authority, if you don't know anything about it, because um, I mean, I don't, I've lived here and so I knew all about it um, from having to like interact with the Port Authority, but it wasn't something that I was super aware of uh, outside of the New York metro region. So I'll give you a bit of a rundown here. It was the very, very first public authority in the United States. Uh, it was established in 1921 to solve a, totally ludicrous problem, um, which was that, so this is a map here, this is a modern map on your on your left there. Uh, it's not gonna il properly illustrate this problem, but uh, hopefully you can follow along here. Manhattan's that little bit in the middle. Um, and the what we're interested in is kind of the left-hand side of the map where the Hudson River is the sort of most leftmost river there. Um, and so basically what happened was that rail lines ended in New Jersey, in, 19, in the 1900s, early 1900s, uh, and all the ports were in Manhattan. And so what that meant was that um, goods had to be shipped across the river to Manhattan in order to go wherever they were going and vice versa. Um, the twist here was that it, even though there were some ports on the New Jersey side, it cost the exact same to it, <laughs> the rail lines had to charge the exact same amount to transfer stuff from New Jersey to Manhattan as it would if it had terminated in New Jersey. Um, and that had got everyone kind of upset. And this was the Interstate Commerce Commission that had made this decision. Um, and so ultimately the Port Authority was created to find a way to like get around that, to solve that problem, um, primarily to maintain the competitiveness of New York City's ports, which was not guaranteed at the time. Um, the solution was a bi-state commission uh, between New York and New Jersey, <clears throat> um, which, fun fact, never solved this problem. Uh, it actually, the problem sort of, there are a combination of things happened. The problem sort of went away in the degree that trucking became more important and they built a bunch of bridges. So trucking sort of replaced gradually rail. And, and on, the, on the flip side, New York's ports withered and died in a story that's kind of interesting in and of itself. Um, and much of the port of uh, the port facilities that you can actually see on the map here to the left um, it are on the New Jersey side now. Not all of them, but all the big ones are now on the New, New Jersey side. So problem solved kind of over time, but it wasn't the Port Authority that necessarily did it. Um, but while they were trying to solve that problem, they actually did a bunch of other stuff. And now, you know, it built, has built and operated uh, well, it didn't build everything here on this list, but it definitely operates the airports, bridges and tunnels, uh, especially on the, the Hudson River, um, the PATH train, which is a commuter rail system, bus terminals, it's got the port, it's got real estate, it's got a lot of stuff going on. Um, so it sort of carved out an empire of sorts, um, even though it never really accomplished what it meant to. Um, and here, you know, here's just a couple of its many, 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 many accomplishments, some of which you will recognize, some of which you may not. Um, they're sort of low key. Um, yeah, tunnels, bridges, buildings, the very, very first container ship that ever sailed in the world sailed out of New Jersey, out of a Port Authority um, facility. They sort of helped kickstart that revolution. Amazing stuff the port's been in, involved in. But I should say here that, you know, for better or worse, not everything the Port Authority did was amazing. And certainly in hindsight, some of its methods may raise some questions, <laughs> but uh, its accomplishments are nonetheless, I think, pretty impressive. Um, and I, 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 maybe this isn't right, but I'm, I'm, I can't think of anyone, any, any other one. It's probably built and led on more iconic projects than any other public authority in the world. I'd be interested if anyone like has, has another example uh, of one that's just done so many things. Um, anyway, the point here is that Port Authority has done so much. So the question of how they did that and you know what, what enabled all this is very much of interest um, for inter infrastructure agencies everywhere. Um, and then usually at this point, uh, the conversation shifts to institutions. 
Um, more and, and to the question of whether it's even fair to ask the question, um, how did they do it? Because it had so many institutional advantages. And so this is where I trigger warn everybody. This is a very institutional talk. Okay, so the Port Authority is undoubtedly a product of another time where when more things were possible in terms of creating public authorities. Like they just hadn't been done a bunch. The governments weren't quite as powerful. Um, and the, the federal government had, a, had enabled this in a way that that um, that was kind of interesting. Um, it has uncommon powers that modern regional infrastructure agencies can only dream of. Um, like, I don't think you could do this today. <laughs> um, so lots of people say it's not a fair comparison um, and all these things are true, but I'm kind of gonna lead into a counterpoint to that. Um, anyway, the, the powers that it had, one, it was permanent. It was created by an act of Congress. If New York and New Jersey wants out of this, they have to go to Congress and ask. Um, and the hope was in doing it that way that, that the government would talk them out of whatever divorce they had planned. Um, so it's permanent, which is which means defection is kind of a tricky one um, in this in this case. Um, it has a very broad mandate. It can build, lease, operate, do whatever with any terminal or transportation facility within the district. It has a monopoly over building crossings over the Hudson River. No one else can do it um, within its geography. Um, it has the authority to get things done, including building in, in some municipalities without really having to be subjected to their all of their rules. They have eminent, powers of eminent domain. Um, it was designed to be politically is, isolated and in, insulated uh, and to the extent that representation was delegated uh, to board members. They were appointed by the states, but they were meant to serve a regional cons constituency and they took that seriously for a long time. Uh, it has fiscal autonomy to a degree. Uh, this is a complicated thing and needs to be unpacked, but it can issue bonds um, secured by revenue and fees and it can revenues and fees from its properties and its assets. And it obviously has toll revenue and fees from all sorts of things like its bridges, tunnels, airports, ports, et cetera. Um, and it's by states. So it, you know, it only has two political masters, right? This is not a giant region where 30 local governments have had to come together and try and agree on stuff. There are two states, that's it, two. So things ought to be simpler, um, right? <laughs> um, so this is a, an organization I characterize as a part and kind of unique, but it's not sovereign. Um, even with all of those institutional advantages, the Port Authority was never, ever able to act unilaterally, just never. Um, this is work on the principal agent problem kind of gets this to a degree, even with only two direct political masters, this two states, the Port Authority's regional ambitions were and are often in conflict with state interests, like all the time. Um, in this context, I think it, the best way to think about organizational effectiveness is that it's relative, right? This, yes, it's a pro it's a product of organizational power, capability, capacity, all that stuff. Um, but the stocks and flows of those are really contextual and shift from project to project. So the Port Authority could have amazing support and be really effective on one project, like for instance, building a bridge, and it could fail miserably at the exact same time on another one. Um, for instance, doing something with the ports. Um, the institutions are the same, totally the same, right? It has the same powers in both cases, but its effectiveness at leveraging them to build supportive coalitions has. Um, so this talk has two points. One is that coalition building is a fundamental component of any type of regional infrastructure project, whether it's led by an ancient behemoth like the Port Authority or something newer and scrappier, but with fewer, fewer like levers. Um, and as a result, governance is kind of inescapable. It's always been there. Um, giant organizations have had to work with partners to get stuff done, whether that's directly on the project or whether that's, you know, as partners or whether that is a supportive coalition to make sure that it goes forward. That's just been inescapable um, all the way, all the way through. Um, so I've developed a frame, we've developed a framework that I'm not really gonna have time to get into in detail, but we can talk about it later. But the basic argument is that organizations can leverage their resources, autonomy and authority, their reputation and culture um, and vision to build supportive coalitions and overcome internal opposition. That's like from the people that they're working for, like the states, 
um, who you think would be gung-ho about it, and external opposition from other stakeholders and groups and interests. Um, the second point that I want to make is that the Port Authority has changed a lot. Um, critics are off, they often, when we, we talk about whether, why is the Port Authority not as effective now as it used to be, they'll often point to the fact that external factors have changed. So it, environmental regulation issues that, that exist today that didn't exist in, in the 20s. Um, and, that, and so it is harder to get funding to, um, you can't just take properties willy-nilly anymore like they used to be able to. Uh, the process needs to be transparent to the public now in a way that the Port Authority was not a huge fan of earlier. Um, so things have changed and so their processes have changed. But I think the, you know, it's, it's not fair to reduce it to these external changes. The organization has changed too. Um, the, for the most part, its formal institutions have stayed the same with a couple of like notable exceptions. Um, but in practice, every single one of the factors that have tended to feed into its success, I mean, the in institutions are the same, but the factors here, the resources, autonomy, the reputation, the culture, entrepreneurial leadership have diminished over time. Um, and in what follows, I'm, I'm only going to be able to do a bit of a whirlwind tour of the Port Authority's experience. And I hope these examples demonstrate that, um, first of all, the power of organizations to get to get stuff done, to get things done, which is, is which is astonishing. But also it, the Port Authority's reliance on coalitions at every step to get that, to do that. And also I'm going to be throwing in how its capacity is diminished over time and, and why that's significant for its effectiveness as an organization. So let's start at the start. George, the, the GW Bridge. Um, that's what we call it here in New York. The George Washington Bridge is, is a very, very iconic um, bridge. And it, it's, it's one of the ones that marks kind of the real beginning, I think, of the authorities' empire. Uh, actually, it, when they started to build this bridge, it was in the process of building two other bridges at the time, but they were kind of small and whatever. This project was huge. It was the longest suspension, suspension bridge in the world at the time that they were building it. Um, and I mean, it's just, it is one of those bridges that you kind of recognize in, instantly, at, like at least if you're from around here. Um, but in building it, I, and I think doing it successfully, the authority really came into its own and firmly established itself as the infrastructure agency, the sort of the infrastructure authority uh, and the go-to for all sorts of big problem solving. Um, in securing the permission to build the bridge, the organization and the bridge's architects heavily um, lobbied and organized the business community on both sides of the river, as well as local representatives. Um, the, the project had been on the plans in various different guises for a while, um, and so there was a lot of behind the scenes networking to ensure that this was something that could go forward. And that was really, really important because it ensured political backing and got it off the drawing board. But it was also really necessary once construction got started um, and state, state legislators in New Jersey who were kind of like, what is this uppity for the authority? Um, wanted to teach it a lesson and also get and influence some of their construction contracts. Um, decided that they they wanted to meddle in the sort of procurement process. The Port Authority uh, was like, no, hard no, you can't just tell us what chains we're going to use to build this bridge. We're going to use the things that are the most and sound from an engineering perspective, especially since no one had tried to build a bridge this big at that time. Um, and so in protest and very consistent with its commitment to engineering excellence and sound planning over politics, the Port Authority shut down construction on all of its other projects. They were just like, no, we're not doing this. Um, the outcry from the business community is what saved it, is what brought New Jersey sort of out of it. And they, they kind of dropped it and backed off. There's a story that comes after that that I'm not going to get into, but it is very significant for the Port Authority. But essentially what you see here is that that coalition of businesses was critical both in getting the project approved, but in also in keeping it running. All right, we're gonna do a little time travel here. Um, transportation governance, innovation. So we're in the 80s now, we're about you know, 50, 50 years later. Uh, the building things have gotten a lot more difficult. So that's, that's a fact. Um, everything in the 80s was harder. Uh, it seemed like 
And it seemed like the Port Authority, even if they wanted to build stuff, couldn't build their way out of some of the problems that they had. Um, and that was really congestion in Manhattan. And so it wasn't just that, you know, there was a lot of traffic on the crossings, but there just was nowhere for everybody to go kind of once they got in. And so one of the solutions at this time um, was to change people's behavior, to entice them onto public transit, and then to try and make the existing flows work better. Um, and be less prone to failure. So I've got three examples here. Um, Transcom, Transit Checks and Easy Pass, um, that some of which you might have heard of and some of which you haven't, maybe. Um, all three were kind of iconic in their own way, but uh, unsung stories. Uh, Transcom is one of the very first uh, regional transport operation centers. Um, and what it did was it brought together 16 different transportation agencies in the region to, to, hand, to try and make traffic flow better, just generally. That sounds really boring, but it was really important. Occasionally, uh, neighboring organized transportation organizations would decide to do construction um, on whatever their infrastructure was and not tell anyone else about it. If that happened, you know, if two neighboring agencies kind of did the same thing on the same routes, and then someone shut down the subway line underneath that just because like they needed to do some maintenance without sort of mentioning it to anyone else. That meant that like a whole segments of the city would just grind to a halt um, and the region because that would reverberate out through the region. So this was a transit, a transportation communications center that was meant to coordinate activities, but not just on construction, but also if there was a big event, um, they could make sure that traffic was flowing well. Um, and that was sort of football games, the Super Bowl, whatever, but also uh, extreme weather was something that they do a lot and that exists to this day and was a model for quite a few others that, that came after that. Um, Easy Pass was an electronic tolling system that was designed to reduce wait times at toll booths. It's a little transponder thing. Transponders are everywhere in the world now. This was in the 1980s, they did this um, uh, and 90s. So it was a, you know, a pretty innovative and advanced for its time. And now that Easy Pass system is adopted in 19 states. Um, so it's, it's huge. Uh, that also obviously involved the collaboration of a whole bunch of different organizations to get that done. Transit Checks was a system for employer, employers to give vouchers um, to, to employees to use public transportation. Um, that is, you know, was sort of revolutionary at the time because there are so many different kinds of public transportation you can use in this region. Um, you needed something that you needed to coordinate everybody so that they would accept it. Um, and so, again, none of that would have been possible without really broad buy-in from all of and collaboration with uh, and support from a really diverse array of transport agencies and, and governments. And, and again, like we tend to focus in infrastructure on the built stuff. Um, but again, like thinking about how, how sort of modern contemporary uh, like regional governance, especially transportation related agencies are working, but I think you could think this for everyone, is that behavioral changes are now sort of just as powerful as building your way out of problems. And that's just my two cents. Uh, World Trade Centers. Gosh, so this is a study in contrast. Uh, the first World Trade Center was like a huge, obviously, literally huge gamble for the organization that was only possible because it was at the height, absolute height of its powers and flush with cash. It was so flush with cash, it like wanted to build these buildings partly to spend the money so that governors wouldn't want, wouldn't force them to give it back to them to do other projects. And so there you go, uh, World Trade Center. Um, it was an incredibly controversial project at the time. It was posed by the city, a whole range of actors in it. Um, the Port Authority worked its networks, uh, was able to counter all these obstacles and push it forward, even though it was like kind of a turkey from day one. Um, this is something I don't know if people remember about the World Trade Center. If you haven't studied it, you don't realize that it was like not a success for a really long time. And then it was only a, su a success because they um, they relaxed some of the rules about tenants. Um, anyway, you know, the, by the 1990s, the Port Authority star had dimmed, so the World Trade Centers are still there, uh, but like the Port Authority is declining. Um, it faces cash constraints. Uh, it, no, it spent a lot of money on this. 
and it's it, it had a pinch in its budget. Um, they had a director that was a real piece of work uh, that eviscerated the organization, really just cut everything out of it, changed the culture, reduced its autonomy, uh, cut out a lot of the experts that employed uh, that, that were sort of the beating heart of the organization um, and were the, the reason that um, people tended to, to respect the organization, the, the Port Authority as like the, the go-to in for engineering excellence. Um, plus it suffered a series of political embarrassments that I can, can go through if we want. Um, this is a huge simplification. Obviously it wasn't like a director that screwed everything up, but the upshot was that when after 9-11 happened, um, it was a shadow of his former self. And that's not just because its offices had been destroyed and 87 of its employees had died in the process. Um, but it, it was just a sort of weakened organization already before that even happened. So where it had led the entire process of building the Twin Towers, it was, and I feel like this is really harsh, and I'm sorry, Port Authority people, if you're watching, um, it was more of a project manager in this, in this sort of newer version of the Port Authority, and it was subject to the political whims, whims from the rebuilding process. And it was also, you know, publicly criticized for messing, for messing that up. So well, well, things are not going great for the Port Authority in the sort of 2000s and onwards. Um, and it, this led to the, its greatest public scandal. So I promised in the blurb, I don't know if anyone read that, but I was like, stick around for the scandal. Here we are. Here's a scandal, Bridgegate, 2013. Um, so in 2013, then Governor Chris Christie, a governor of New Jersey, uh, ordered the Port Authority to shut down one of the entrances to this lovely bridge that you may remember from the very first example that I gave. So now this is the modern bridge. It's a little bit blurry. Um, but anyway, um, we're looking at New Jersey actually in this picture. So you'll just have to imagine this process. Anyway, Chris Christie, um, is he gets a little pissed at the mayor of Fort Lee because, uh, which is the town right on the other side of the bridge that we're kind of looking at right now, because he did not support his reelection bid. Um, so through various sur surrogates uh, at the Port Authority, he ordered the closure of uh, a couple of lanes onto this bridge um, for four days. And that created gridlock in Fort Lee, just like crippled the whole city. Um, because it had some lanes that were supposed to go dedicated through the city to get onto this bridge. Um, and if you think that gridlock isn't that big of a deal, I mean, think about it. People couldn't get to work. Kids were stuck on school buses for like hours and hours or like couldn't get to school. Um, emergency vehicles were stuck um, and couldn't go anywhere. It's just like a ground to a halt. Um, so that in and of itself is pretty dramatic. Um, when it came to light that the sort of what had happened, um, that resulted in a Supreme Court corruption case in which several of Christie's collaborators were indicted and convicted of various charges. Um, yeah, so it was a bit dramatic. Uh, and in case you're wondering, no, a government should a governor should not be able to do that um, unilaterally. But because of practices that have been evolving that had been at that point evolving over decades, the agency had turned into a patronage riddled organization where this sort of thing was not only thinkable and possible, but it like actually happened. Um, Christie got off scot-free. No one ever could decisively prove that he was the one who ordered it, but everyone kind of, it's an open secret that that's definitely what happened. I'm saying. Um, anyway, no, I think it's important to note here that the formal institutions of this organization had not changed much since 1921. Um, informally though, it had undergone all sorts of pro different changes. So its resources had eroded, its autonomy had eroded, its culture was one where patronage was, was fine. This is from an organization that was designed to be politically insulated, that was supposed to view professionalism um, above all, um, that was meant to serve a regional constituency. No, like the culture in at this point, at least was, was one where like, you get this, I get that, and we're just gonna turn a blind eye to each other's shenanigans. Bam, there's some shenanigans in there. And the leadership had eroded to the degree that it was hardly the same organization that it was in the, you know, and its progressive era architects would have been oh, so disappointed. Um, all right, so, and this is sort of where I wanna to sum it up. Wow, that's a bummer. Okay, so before I get onto this, I just wanna say, the Port Authority is, is 
it's still an effective organization, despite all of that. Um, it's relatively effective, not as effective as it used to be. Um, it definitely is, is less prone to scandal currently, um, but definitely it's in the public eye now um, and critiqued and its reputation is kind of so, so right now. Um, I think that there's a chance it comes back from that and, and rebuilds, but we're in a very interesting era of transition for this organization from a governance point of view. Um, anyway, so going back to this, this sort of point that I want to make, um, I think this arc reinforces a couple of core arguments. First is the degree to which this powerful organization declined, um, and, that, and that challenges the idea that there is an ideal and robust institutional form. Nothing's immutable, right? It's, you think you've got it nailed, and then you know, things shift over time, and, and it's not what you expected. Um, so there are lots of unintended consequences that get baked into institutional design. Um, secondly, collaboration was so crucial, um, particularly with other governments and transportation actors, like no matter what. And that challenges the idea that there can be an appropriate institutional solution that kind of neatly encapsulates any problem, particularly at the regional scale, where you're always going to be in this crazy, overlapping, fragmented world. Um, and you just cannot get away from, from that. So governance, I think, is inevitable. And if it's inevitable, I think that means a couple of things for us. One is obviously, I think we're already collectively there on the scholarship of regional governance, focusing more on coordination, coalition building, kind of challenges that arise from pluralism, um, thinking more about the soft kinds of capabilities that are required. Um, I think that organizations, to the extent that we're studying these sort of entities and trying to glean lessons from them and make them work better, um, they should seek to develop these soft capabilities. And that's not just recognizing that they need to collaborate, like they're not gonna be able to go it alone kind of on anything. And so to just bite the bullet and figure out who their partners need to be and make friends, um, but also developing the capacity internally to do that regularly, to make that part of your culture, um, part of what, what you're all about as an organization. Um, and then obviously senior levels of government um, can contribute by shifting incentive structures, removing barriers, um, and all sorts of things like that if they want to get in the mix. Um, all right, that's all I have to say today. I know that was a huge whirlwind. I dumped a lot of stuff on you. Um, but uh, I'm really excited to hear what, I, we have this great lineup of discussants. I'm psyched to hear what they have to say. They may not be responding to this directly, um, but to sort of kickstart a conversation about the governance of regional infrastructure and infrastructural regionalism and what it means beyond this specific example. So thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Jen. Yes, and as you mentioned, uh, we'll now hear from uh, three respondents in turn and I'd like to turn things over now to uh, Julie Sedell uh, from the University of Illinois to get us started. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, thanks for the invitation. Um, that was a really interesting. I always love hearing um, hearing Jen speak um, because of the kind of the combination of very specific empirical or historical details and also that larger context um, in terms of kind of the the meanings in a um, in, in this case an institutional sense, uh, but of course always an infrastructural sense. Um, and so I'm, I am actually going to pr pretty much directly respond um, to a, a couple of points. And in particular, I, you started out um, talking about, you know, the, the Port Authority is this huge institution. It was the first one of its kind um, that, that kind of prompted the question, well, well, why, why look at the outlier, right? If, if this is the, the largest one, um, New York City is, you know, by far the most complex metropolitan area in the U.S. Um, is, is, it, is it just unique in its, its size and its complexity? Um, and as you talked, I think a number of points came out that said, no, there, there are reasons to study the, the very largest, most complex um, and kind of lessons that we might, might take away for our, our smaller, um, but perhaps equally complicated uh, regions that we look at. Um, and so one, um, one is, of course, one of the main points that you made is that 
even in this large structure, this, this institution with a lot of authority, um, there still has to be collaboration that takes place. Um, so that no, no matter what the size of, of the institution, I thought that was, that was a great point. And kind of the flip side of that, that was under the surface, I think, is that even within this large organization, individuals always matter to a large extent, um, whether it's a governor doing things for his own purposes or um, engineers who have very clear ideas about how things should be built. Um, even within these large institutional structures, a lot depends on, you know, one person in power, of course, the, the director of the, the Port Authority at one time, um, but that we, we often kind of conflate the, the institution perhaps with, with one, as being one object, um, but there are people within that that pursue their own goals, their own ends, um, and that's, that can be a, an interesting point too. Um, another reason for why the outlier, I guess I would say, um, especially in, in this particular example, if you can make it there, you can make it anywhere, right? That if you can see how, how things get done despite the complexity, the, the extra complexity in New York, if we can untangle and understand how this institution has enabled all this large infrastructure to be built, what difference that's made to the city, to, to cities across the river, then we can understand smaller scale um, issues, smaller, physically smaller regions, um, regions with less population. And so taking on the challenge of delving into this incredibly complicated place um, is worth, uh, again, you know, the, the, the findings that you draw out of here are, are um, you know, might have to be resized perhaps, but, but are, are relevant to lots of other kinds of places. Um, one, one variation or one part of that uh, is of course the, the innovations that get adapted here. Um, I really liked that, that notion of you know, turning from the physical infrastructure to the non-physical infrastructure, um, but that you know, easy pass and, and the, the transit checks as examples of these are now kind of standard operating procedure in, in a lot of places and it takes that very large institution in that very large metro area to come up with these kinds of things and implement them. And again, then other places, go, oh yeah, we, we might, we can do this too. If New York can do it, we can, we can probably handle this as well. Um, a couple other things that come to mind. Um, the, the story of the, the building of the World Trade Center was interesting because it, it echoed some things that I've found in my own work about um, metropolitan governance and sustainability. And that's surprisingly often, it's a case of spending the money while you can, that these unexpected sources of funding come along. And if you have projects ready that you can plug that money into, things happen. Um, other times it's, oh, we have a lot of money. What are we gonna do with it? Um, and this this can be a little difficult then for re replicability, right? Because it's, it's um, you know, fortuitous that the money is there when it is. But again, that seems to happen a fair amount of the time. And so that's that's kind of interesting in and of itself. And then the other, the last point that I wanted to make about why, why studying the outlier, um, Bridgegate is just fascinating to me. Um, and in part, because I'm always interested in what happens just outside the infrastructure. And this is such a prime example of how this one small community gets seriously affected um, because it's it's normally a space of flows, and suddenly that flow stops, and so how it how it completely disrupts this entire community, and that of course can happen in a traffic jam and a weather situation. Um, but in this case, it's it's because infrastructure is being used as a weapon of sorts, um, and in particular the the ability the the flow capability of that infrastructure is being deliberately used in a in a weaponized way, um, and it made made me think of. Um, of projects that I've recently worked on looking at protests on highways and on bridges and how those are treated as threats to security um, of the region, of the country even. Um, and I don't know that I heard any, any of that language around Bridgegate as it being anything, I mean, inconvenient, um, threatening, you know, 
on, on a very small scale, but I don't I don't know how how it, large it happened. It. it happened on the week mm -hmm. of the of the of an anniversary of September 11th. And so there was an interesting like slight terrorist link. I mean, there there was it, what that wasn't significant, but it, that did mm -hmm. did happen. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but that is okay. no, that's fine. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, cause that rhetoric, you know, if, if infrastructure is so foundational, then when we, when we threaten it's, it's easy usage, um, how does that get interpreted? I guess. Um, one question that, that I had, um, just to wrap this up is I was thinking about to what extent kind of commuters are a constituency for the port authority, um, with, with the bridges and tunnels and, and rail systems. And as, um, as commuters are only slowly returning to Manhattan and many of them might not return, how is that going to affect the Port Authority's ability to, to have these, these coalitions or to have this constituency if a lot of folks are just staying across the river and working from home now? Um, and we don't know how, how long an effect that might have, but I'm just curious to know what you would think. So, thanks. Thank you, Julie. I uh, will turn now to uh, John Harrison from Loughborough. Thanks, Michael, um, and thanks, Jen, for a fascinating presentation. Um, just a little bit of context here, um, just to say thank you as well to Jen, because she gave us a, a set of slides and a walkthrough of the presentation a few days ago, um, which has been really helpful in terms of formulating uh, a few questions and ideas. Uh, also quite worrying because you've now set the bar so high that anybody else that does this has now been set a, a precedent of, of what, what's expected. So thanks for that, Jen. And hopefully in five minutes time, you're still speaking to me once I've kind of gone through what I think are three questions that uh, your talk um, threw up for me. The first one, I'm going to kind of agree with Julie in some senses with the, just the overarching nature of the presentation is that your, your work always is grounded in kind of real examples, empirical research, and it, it, you can see the, 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 the kind of the real world relevance. But also there's always been this big picture um, kind of aspect in terms of some of the broader debates. So the first question I've got is I've written down on a piece of paper in front of me. I've called it the big picture Jen Nellis question. And so apologies for this one, but I think it's, it's it, it maybe just relate. I'd be interested to hear a little bit more about where and how you've gone about doing this project and the work around it, because the subtitle that you had for the, the, the talk today uh, mentions three things. It mentions infrastructure, it mentioned regional governance, and it mentioned metropolitan New York. And I guess picking up on one of the points that Michael made about the Noir network, um, as in, with my research interests, the one about seeing like a region is the one that appeals uh, straight away. And I guess I'm interested in what your entry point into these debates is, because depending on whether you take infrastructure, whether you take regional governance, or whether you take the metropolitan region of New York, you get a different regional geography. And even within, say, infrastructure, depending on the type of infrastructure you pick, um, you get a, a different type of regional geography. So I'm interested to see where your starting point is, but also how you manage that. Because in the, the walkthrough video that you gave us a few days ago, and I know in the presentation today, you, you didn't use the phrase ex uh, specifically, but it's it's present in the, in the talk. You talked about the, the challenge that he presented you trying to make sense of this case study or this, this story you want to tell and how you try to fit it into the existing frameworks that you already know. Um, so the Mobilising Metropolis um, book that you mentioned, um, I think is really interesting because when I think of you and the work that you, you, you where your starting point is, I think when I, when, you, when, when I hear your name or when I think about your work, I think about your starting point being regional institutions, um, and regional governance. You've now moved with Michael and John Paul into this idea of kind of infrastructure regionalism and the Noir Research Network. Um, and now with the, the Mobilised Metropolis book, we have the, the kind of metropolis aspect. So you're almost playing around with these three different aspects. I wonder, through this project, are you professionally and intellectually moving into... If, how do you manage those three different groups? Because... Um, I'd be interested to see how, um, is that a kind of your perspective as a researcher or is it how you tell the story and how are you trying to almost negotiate those, those tensions? Um, so I apologise, that is the really big picture question. Um, it's kind of asking you to kind of think about your own, your own career as much as anything. More specifically then, two quick questions to finish off with. Um, lots of things in that presentation that I really enjoy. Um, 
obviously with the title, the hundred years aspect, I really like the emphasis on temporality. Um, and you mentioned periodization. I guess my question when we think about um, say hundred year anniversaries or periodization is that that tendency towards nostalgia. And I think there's an element of that that comes through in the presentation, um, which is you've got the slide about the Port Authority and its achievements. And then towards the end, we get the shenanigans with Bridgegate. And how do you how are you trying to manage or negotiate in your own mind the story that potentially we we almost um, miss some of the historical aspects? We think of it as nostalgic and achievement, but actually there was probably as much tension and controversy and shenanigans 100 years ago as there is today. But there's a tendency to almost like the short termism. We see that that. We see the shenanigans now, but we kind of write them out of the history. So, so that's one just to open up. And then finally, the Port Authority as enabler. That comes through very strongly in the presentation, but obviously you talk about how it becomes a, a, a something of a bear moth. It becomes a, a big, powerful institution from, from what was its origins. And I guess the 100-year anniversary aspect, we think about the achievements and what it's enabled. I wonder how much there's the other story about how much the port authority has blocked um in terms of potential infrastructure regionalism and developments um there's there's clearly another story there and i don't know whether your research has 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 come across any of that or or if you've got a reflection on it Um, so three questions hopefully we're still speaking in an hour's time all right thank you thank you john uh, and uh, finally, uh, let's hear from Marcus Hess from the University of Luxembourg, and then we'll have an opportunity for Jim to respond to all three interlocutors. And uh, I also invite all of our uh, audience to start formulating those questions and popping those in the chat. Uh, Marcus, over to you. Yeah, uh, thanks as well for inviting me to uh, listen to that. It was brilliant. It was really inspiring. Um, and I think uh, Noir is a really good idea um, when I started with, with my professional stuff, uh, infrastructure policy was in the hands of economists or engineers. So that these were those powerful people who were driving the whole infrastructure system. And it's uh, extremely important that people from other disciplines, geographers, planners, historians, whatever, social scientists are taking over this subject because it is so often uh, reduced to the technicalities of uh, yeah, giving, giving things to work, giving uh, vehicles to flow and cities to grow out. So this, this world perspective is really good. Uh, so I enjoyed this uh, very much. I was, um, it's interesting to, to listen to a presentation of 100 years of these infrastructure setting Port Authority in New York City. And there's, there's no mentioning of Robert Moses. Um, this is interesting because uh, in, in the planning communities, people are so obsessed by his legacy in, uh, for the better or for the worse, whatever. Uh, and it's interesting to see that, that such a also very powerful guy does not pop up here, which brought me to my question. Uh, we have learned about these two states and uh, this looked a rather smart organization, which is um, pretty powerful uh, because it's so simple. And you said it, it at, at that time, things were really simple, but powerful, which is a really nice combination of, of properties. And I was wondering, we did not uh, hear um, a lot about the cities who are participating in this under the umbrella of uh, the two states. And I could imagine that New York City has played a certain role as probably uh, the primus inter pares, the, the, the biggest one uh, in, in the range of, of the others. And um, I would simply be interested in listening, uh, getting more information on whether this was actually um, a source of conflict or contestation below the state level. Also in terms when it comes to implementation. Um, second point is, I guess that in this whole idea of infrastructure provision, there are also some temporalities of the infrastructure system as such, because uh, it takes years to get all these big things uh, implemented and working. And at the same time, all infrastructure systems are utterly and necessarily um, 
incomplete. So they are, they're always, there's always, they are always under construction if you want. And this also creates some, uh, some poli a pol certain political mess because uh, the political parties have to promise that things are working finally after this turnpike is being done, after this tunnel is being built, after this piece of infrastructure is there, then we will get closer to the solution, closer to the infrastructural fix and this is, of course, not the case because um, it's always under construction. It's always insufficient, and in a region that is that is growing and that is becoming so big, the question is um, how how do they deal actually with this uh, idea that they are always close to the limits of their own promise? I I wonder whether this institution this very powerful, very tradition rich institution has ever been concerned about or thinking of these uh, limitations. And this, this whole power issue that is really interesting. I would, I would like to learn more about this. Why are, um, are there no teeth in terms of institutional fix? I think there is no simple solution. This is pretty clear. And particularly in the case of New York City, the whole metropolitan area, one could also wonder, is that region actually, is, it, is anybody possible to steer that region, to plan for that region? Or is that region far too big to be planned for? So that it meanwhile has reached a scale and a scope that even with the 100 years ago institutional apparatus, um, it, could no longer be steered because of complexity, because of there's, there's simply too, mu too much demand, too much uh, also conflict, contestation, the question of how do um, civil society actors, how do NGOs actually uh, mediate this whole field of politics, policy making, and uh, interest groups. So um, I have a lot more questions, but I think I could leave it over here. So that uh, we will also have some time for discussion. Thank you very much. It was really inspiring. Thank you very much to uh, Marcus and to John and to Julie uh, for their, their remarks. That, that gets us back to Jen. Uh, Jen, would you like to take the floor and, uh, and respond to anybody on the panel that you're still going to be talking to? I'm not talking to any. You're dead to me, all of you. <laughs> Just kidding. This is, those are all amazing questions. Um, and Marcus, it's good that you have some other questions on deck because it's not like the chat is blowing up right now. So I hope that that you and the audience will start to participate uh, and and give give us some questions. And they can be for me or for any one of the panelists, including Michael, if you feel like asking him a question. If you go for it. Um, okay. So that was a lot of. Uh, really good questions. I, I wrote them down. I hope that I can remember to get to them all. Um, I'm going to start with Julie's question about the outlier, and I'm going to answer it kind of obliquely, indirectly, with a story, um, which is Port Authority. Why, like it's, it's, it's a good question why I am studying this in the first place. Partly, I live in New York, um, and so it's kind of the biggest behemoth and you know biggest infrastructure agency. And it's when I've tried to study various aspects of infrastructure in this region, I keep coming across it. But the real answer is because I wrote a paper with a guy named Phil Plotch, um, who had, was buddies with Jim Doig, who wrote Empire on the Hudson, who wanted to write, who'd been asked basically to write, like his first book covered the first 50 years of the Port Authority. And now we were coming up on the centenary. Uh, and he was like, I don't know, should I do this? So Jim was like on the fence. Phil had asked Phil, Phil came to me and I was like, no, you gotta do this. This is amazing, like definitely. Um, yeah, so we we decided ultimately the three of us decided to to write this book and Jim's book. If anyone has come across it, and I can, I can plug it here as well. I guess it's right here. Empire on the Hudson, fascinating read. It's like the book on the Port Authority until ours comes out. Obviously, um, covers the first fifty years. Uh, is is very much about entrepreneurial leaders and their role. In, yeah, I think my lamp's gonna fall over now. Okay, but entrepreneurial leaders and their role in making these things happen. It's actually called Entrepreneurial Vision and Political Power at the Port of New York Authority. 
Um, anyway, so we started to write it and it was, it was really essentially, we had to cover a hundred years. There was a lot of infrastructure to cover. So we divided up the chapters into airports, ports, the World Trade Center, um, mobility, buildings and bridges, the origins. There's all sorts of stuff that we cover. We do it sort of thematically. And when you're ever you're working in a group, you kind of have to reel in uh, your own individual kind of ego and your own thing. And so my contribution was to do the framing related, like frame this as I think the entrepreneurial leadership thing, and this kind of goes to Julie's point, is is like it oversimplifies it too. It's just like great men, and they're inevitably men, can do great things. <laughs> and I was like, it's not that. It's not just that. What it is, and it's not even just the organization. It's that organizations themselves, sure, they have visionary leaders. What well, they get stuff done when they don't have visionary leaders too. When they have ordinary leaders. Um, and a lot of what enables organizations to get things done is the fact that you, yeah, sure, you have a great man and now like anybody, obviously, um, but they have to have the tools in order to do what they do. Um, and so that was my hook. And this might kind of get to some one of John's questions, too. And, that, and so you can you can tell from this description that this was not a book. This was not an argument about a regionalism at all like this was an argument about a, a, an organization it's, it was an institutional argument to, essentially um and and about a, a, an organizational behavior kind of argument weirdly um and a public administration kind of argument and so i was very much like i was a little bit out of my comfort zone but i'm a political scientist so this is um like i can dabble in this area as well um but you know it <laughs> It, so we wrote the project, we wrote this book, and it's sort of history, sort of public, you know, sort of reflection on the sort of institutional uh, evolu evolution of this organization. And uh, we got review reviews back um, from the University of Michigan Press, and I know one of them was by Richardson Dilworth, and one of them, one of the reviews said, Jen, because they knew who we were. Uh, you're an expert on regional governance. Why is there not more regional governance in here? <laughs> and I was like, because it's not really a book about regional governance. It's like about an organization that happens to be regional. It's dealing with fragmentation at this level. Um, it's not a regional organization in the sense that I was comfortable with, as John alluded to, right? Which was more horizontal intermunicipal cooperation. That's my jam. I'm like, I'm like a comfortable in this sort of collaborative consensus building kind of land. I was not as comfortable in this, in this very strong top-down kind of organization kind of thing with only two political masters. But, um, you know, it, it captured my imagination because it, it was so different. And this is again, why we sort of, why the outlier. Um, so the, the, one of the stories is that this book was never designed, this project, this talk that I gave you is not about the book. It's, it's using elements of the book to speak to a noir agenda, to a regionalism agenda, uh, to like some questions that we have as regional scholars. Um, and so when Richardson made that comment, I was like, oh God. And my co-author was like, yeah, Jen, <laughs> why is there no more regionalism in here? And I was like, cause then it would be a different book. It would be a different thing altogether. I would have done it, written it differently. But I had to sort of balance Phil and Jim when he was part of it, their, their plans for this as well. Um, and so it wasn't a regional book. Um, that said, when the opportunity for this, this is a long answer, I'm really sorry. Um, when the opportunity for this keynote came up, uh, it, it was like, it was very fortuitous because I was like, oh man, now, now I have to do a keynote. I mean, thank you, RSA. Uh, but also I didn't really have a story because JP and Michael were like, just do your book. And I was like, yeah, but my book's not like for, it's not really tailored for this audience, but it's so it forced me to solve this problem. And that's why I'm kind of interested, specifically interested in everyone's feedback on this. It's like, did I actually pull out a series of lessons that are not like they're not going to be what frames the whole book but they're kind of like a set of reflections on like hey if you're interested in regional institutions um here and where this fits in the literature on regionalism then like this is what i've got and so that's that's the story it's not it's not that we had a specific overarching question and then we're like let's study the port authority that seems interesting it kind of came around the other way around and i'm sorry for any 
PhD students or early career researchers out there who see the dirty truth behind how books happen. But like usually it's you go out drinking with a buddy and you end up starting on a research network or writing a book or whatever. And this is very much one of those cases where I roll with it. Um, and just to, I'll come back to Julie's um, other question about this too, but I'll kind of segue into John's question about like, what do, what am I as a researcher in this sense? And the answer is it's complicated. Um, I, I think I'm frustrating to a lot of people because I'm very omnivorous. I'm just sort of like, oh, well, that's interesting. Oh, that's interesting. Like I'm studying innovation and productivity policy right now at Oxford Brooks. That's not this at all. It's, <laughs> there's spatial dimensions, but it's not, it's not specifically infrastructure. It's not specifically regional governance. Um, but I kind of come at all these things with, with questions about how, in this case with the Port Authority, it was about New York is such a complex metropolitan region. This thing has been around forever. And yet, um, you know, I, I'm curious as to like how it got everything done because right now there's this narrative that we can't build anything. We can't build anything in this region. It's been, it's been a disaster really. Like the second Avenue subway has taken like decades to build and we've only gotten this far on it. Um, like what's going on uh, is, is sort of an interesting question. Um, so I have like personal interest in that, but as a professional one as well. Um, and like, where does the Port Authority fit in all of this? Um, because they do seem to be the ones that tend to be able to get things done, but they've been stymied at every, they've been stymied in lots of cases. And I could go into an example of many examples of where they were not able to get what they wanted to do done. But um, essentially, like, my interest is, is in thinking about how things get coordinated in metropolitan regions, and this was an opportunity to look at something solid. My previous book was on with Dave Miller and James J. Rickaba and George Dory from the University of Pittsburgh, um, was focused on regional intergovernmental organizations, and as I said, these are, these are voluntary structures for the most part. Um, uh, and they get a lot of crap. Like people don't take us seriously. They're like, oh, you're studying those. They're like, why would you do that? They're not really important. And I'm like, yes, they are. They can be, they definitely can be. And so this idea of like trying to govern in, in the context of fragmentation is something that interests me. And whatever scale you are looking at, you have to kind of deal with that. So I guess, um, John, I'm interested in metro regions. Um, and how you, you govern across jurisdictional boundaries, that there's a lot of different ways to do that. Um, I'm interested in infrastructure because, but mostly as, as a sort of metaphor, right? Like a sort of as the thing that ties regions together in ways. Like I also really dig trains, like I'm into those. Um, ships, studying the port was awesome. But like, I'm not an infrastructure scholar, at the heart of it. I'm a scholar of sort of governance, really, more, more generally. And so I think that kind of answers that question, sort of. But if I didn't, let me know. I'm talking a lot. Julie, your question about commuters being a constituency. Uh, it's complicated. Yes, they are a constituency. Commuters come from all sorts of different places, though. And so now at, the, at this point, we, we have an interesting dynamic, which is, uh, so it, back in the day, commuters were less of a thing. Now they're obviously more, <laughs> more of a thing and now they're sort of becoming less of a thing, um, right? But um, I think it would be most accurate in the sort of modern Port Authority treated commuters as sort of not a monolithic group but as a, they were constituents from various different parts of the region. So there are commuters from Staten Island. That's a sort of a different animal from commuters from New Jersey. Um, there are computer, commuters from Long Island, which the Port Authority had very little to do with because those are all under the MTA structure. Um, so it was more like whenever they were building, doing something, they had to balance the, where are the tolls gonna be on these various bridges? like one group of commuters would be more upset than another. Um, it wasn't a monolithic group. Um, I know that's not necessarily what you were asking, um, but what it meant for coalition building, if coming back to sort of the end bit of that question, was that there wasn't a way to build coalitions of commuters. 
it was that sometimes you had to be like New Jersey, we're going to deal with the New York commuters on this. And that means that we have to build a bridge and it's going to cost a lot of money. So, and that's where deal making and negotiation comes in, right? And, and those constituencies are very powerful and vocal um, for governors to pay attention to. And now as much as that, now that political influence is such a big deal, tolls, which if you think about them are like a major source of revenue, are highly political and politicized. So like you wanna raise that 25 cents, that's gonna be like five years of negotiation. And I can tell you some fun, like that's an exaggeration, but like I can tell you some funny stories about that. Um, the Port Authority's fortunes plummeted during the pandemic, right? Zero, they were getting nothing from their airports, right? Just like they were at 4% or something. The, the money that they were getting from their tolls was something like 17%, like it went down a lot. They were getting like less than a third of what they normally do. Um, so their finances are now, I'm like not at the table for this, but I have to imagine they're scary. Um, and so, yeah, people are coming back. The bridges are back. P commuters on the bridges are back, more or less. Um, the transit systems less so, but are creeping back up. And so we'll see. It doesn't fundamentally change though the geographies of the constituencies, I don't think, um, in their coalition building. Um, but it does sort of change it might change the sort of balance of what's important. So the ports are one of those things in their portfolio that were like, sometimes in the red, sometimes not. Um, during the pandemic, they were like, they were like up at 400% or something. So it's so interesting to see that this is an advantage of a diverse organization too, where, you know, it's kind of swings and turnabouts on that stuff. Okay, so I think that's Julie's, uh, John, I'm just going to say that I answered your first question. I don't know if I did that well. Um, your, but we can follow up on that. Uh, the emphasis on temporality and our tendency towards nostalgia. Very, very interesting. And like when we were writing this book, it's sort of tempting, you're right, like to look at it and be like, look at how great they were. This is so fantastic. They built this bridge, they built the tunnel. Like they built this port, they won this battle, they won that battle. It was like, you know, you, there's, there is like, you kind of build a bit of a mythology in your head, but there are a lot of dark sides that I sort of alluded to that where I was like, maybe it wasn't for the best. <laughs> Were there methods always above board? Like maybe not, <laughs> maybe not. Um, and I think we, we could be more brutal about highlighting that stuff in the book um and i and i could certainly have done that more in the in the talk but yeah the first of all there were big failures and we talk about that in the book because we're not just interested in successes um we're interested in why they weren't able to get stuff done too like where did the coalition building fail it failed in a bunch of different places um they tried to build a fourth airport in new jersey just failed utterly at that. Um, they had or tried to replace some bridges on Staten Island, failed at that for many years until finally they managed to get it done. Um, but it was it was like a 30 year odyssey trying to trying to get these things replaced. Um, there, I mean, there are lots of others that we could talk about. I mean, the World Trade Center too, I think is one of those things that you kind of look at it as like, a, oh, yeah, they got bit, it got built, but it was like, scandalous and messy. Um, I think you're right in saying that the, the, even the successes were super controversial. And I think this is where the coalition stuff comes in really handy is that you start to understand the various forces that are arrayed against and for different projects in the region, which is not unusual, right? But um, their ability to kind of the Port Authority's ability as an organization to kind of rise above all of that and, and sort of look good doing it um, was something that was, was interesting, even when it was sort of like, there was sort of dirt, it was sort of dirty in the background. Like they destroyed and raised neighborhoods, like same as Moses, not as big, not as large scale, but like that hap it happened. Um, and, and I think that's something that we need to sort of look at and be like, yep. Um, 
yeah, they weren't great. So I think in the book, there's a little bit more of that background. Um, and that it's not totally written out of the story. Uh, but it is certainly not the like this isn't a takedown of the Port Authority and how awful they were. This is more of a like, let's 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 be balanced and like trying to understand what happened here. Um, I wrote something here that I cannot read, but it says blah, 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 something it is blocked projects that it had blocked. Um, that's a really good question because it's really hard to know that. Um, I can't think of anything that it it stopped happening other than the fact that. I mean, it was very entrepreneurial and empire-y at the beginning. Um, and so it has a monopoly on building crossings on the Hudson, which is why the Tappan Zee Bridge, which was not built by the Port Authority, um, which crosses further north uh, up the river, is built like at a really stupid place in the river because it's super wide, but it was just outside of Port Authority territory. So, so like there are workarounds, but it, they're not smart. I shouldn't call it the Tappan Zee Bridge. I think it's now the Mario Cuomo Bridge or something. Um, our previous governor renamed it. Um, so yeah, actually, I would have to think a little bit more about that. I don't know uh, any any other blockages, but my co-author, who has an encyclopedic knowledge of all of the things, probably would be able to answer that better than me. Marcus. Uh, yes, infrastructure was the domain of economists and engineers. I, I'm pro this now. We're moving into a bit more of a social science-y land. Um, and I think that it's a great, again, like for me, the infrastructure is really, it's a lens through which to understand governance, to understand, it's like just something you can kind of hook into to understand the dynamics of governance. Well, you could have equally been looking at any sort of less visible thing. Um, trying to deal with spatial inequalities, which is something that I'm involved with a little bit in the UK, is one of those things um, that's sort of hard to see. So that's why I like infrastructure personally. Um, I did not mention Robert Moses, you were right. Um, he comes up in the book a couple of times. Uh, Robert Moses and his contemporary at the Port Authority, Augustus Tobin, did not get along. They were like, there's a story. Uh, so they did until they did until they kind of worked, learned how to get together. Um, so in the sort of early days of the Port Authority, um, they didn't control the airports. Airports existed, so Newark's airport existed, JFK existed, uh, uh, and LaGuardia existed, but they were city properties in New York and they were city, they would belong to Newark in Newark. Um, as part of a deal uh, with Newark, they dealt they just sort of handed over their airport and their port to the port authority said like these are regional you should manage them um and for a while the city the port authority had been trying to get their hands on the two airports in new york um and hadn't been successful um but they things started to happen where um, the city was starting, it was sort of hemorrhaging money on various things and like really needed a solution. So they were thinking about handing it over to Moses, but it was sort of at the time when <laughs> his star was dimming a little bit and people were like, what? No, hell no, that guy's corrupt. Like there's corruption. It's just no good. Um, and the, the Port Authority came along and all like squeaky clean. They're like, we can raise bonds. We're financially secure. We're against patronage. We're Look at us, we're a choir boys running infrastructure. Uh, they convinced all the bankers, basically, what this is part of their coalition building for the airport thing. They convinced all the bankers to back them. And, and the city was like, all right, I don't know, we'll just give it to the Port Authority. They seem less of a mess. And that's what happened. And Robert Moses was not pleased with that. Um, there were other instances where they butted heads over the Port Authority bus terminal was another one. Um, eventually, they got together and built the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, but Tobin wrote in his, um, his I, I can't remember if it's in the, his autobiography or somewhere else, that whenever he met with Moses, he left the door open behind him so he could run out if he needed to. Quick escape. Um, so that's Robert Moses for you, right? He's, he's in, but he's sort of like a, uh, and this feeds into some of your questions about New York City and what its relationship was to the Port Authority as 
and and this is this is again where I was like in weird territory because I study cities and how they cooperate with one another, not states and how they cooperate with one another. Um, and so, but I my my thought was like, oh no, the city must play a role, and it does. So the city is has over time been very uh, opposed essentially to the Port Authority. It operates without restriction on its territory, and it can't the city can't do anything about it really. They want to build a giant building and like dig a hole in the ground they can do that um without without really much in the way of new york city being like oh no no we, we don't want a hole there um and that's partly because they're not represented and like that was deliberate uh so over time new york city specifically and the other communities but in mostly the city of new york um, has like had a really tumultuous relationship with the Port Authority, like on many levels understands that it's vital for like commuters don't get to New York City from New Jersey without Port Authority properties. It's just like, they can't happen. Um, um, so, well, I guess you could, yep, yeah, no, you can't do it. <laughs> so at least by like vehicle. Uh, so there's like a, an understanding that it has done great things, it is important, um, but it is, it's always been tense in, a, in various ways. And I think different mayors have, have really embraced or disliked the Port Authority to different levels. And so, uh, you know, the fact that the Port Authority was responsible in many ways for the them losing revenue for their airports, right? So the Port Authority controls that all now. Um, for the decline of its ports. That's something that kind of is a bit of a chip on their shoulder too, although no one really thinks about it anymore because that's where ports belong, where there's more space. Um, yeah, so the city, you know, the city's had a really complicated relationship. And as someone who studies these things, I've always thought that one of the things that might, not fix, but like might be a thing that helps to fix some of the political problems that we haven't really like delved into too much um, with the Port Authority is that you start to add in some of these local voices, like add in representation from the cities that are now significant, right? We've got Newark, we've got Jersey City, New York, um, Fort Lee. There are like various cities all around that would be, re have relevant views um, and that might deserve actual formal representation in some way. Um, and that could counter some of the bi-state stuff where like, I think the cities could just be like, get over it. Like you got, you guys are way over in Albany and Trenton. Like we're right here, we need to build stuff yesterday. Like let's get it done. Um, so I feel like that including the cities more might be an institutional reform that I would be into. Um, I think that was all, I might not have gotten everything there. I think it was a pretty comprehensive uh, thought, Jen. Um, yeah, I talked a lot. Maybe, maybe I should this. Well, uh, maybe I'll give you a, a chance for a breath and uh, note that there's at least three questions in the chat that we should uh, we should also touch on. And uh, Timothy Moss is in the room. Hi, Timothy. And uh, let me just read that uh, question uh, that you said to, to I think, uh, uh, Jen, but also more broadly. Um, if the Port Authority is a hammer, doesn't every infrastructure problem in its territory look like a nail? So how has this institutional behemoth uh, affected other infrastructures, the wider region or metropolitan governance there? Oh, that's a tough one. I mean, I would agree with you to a certain degree if I thought, if their answer to everything was build, 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 which it is not. Um, and it hasn't always been. Um, there is a lot, and there's, this comes out way more in the book, and I think actually is like a theme that might be worth emphasizing more, is, is that like the behavioral change and the like thinking in, in terms of systems is something that's a huge advantage. Uh, is, so those two things are a bit separate. Um, the Port Authority is, because it has so many different types of infrastructure that it deals with, roads, rail, whatever, those are almost all kind of governed within their separate silos within the system. Um, and so it's, there's often kind of conflict within the organization about like how to solve a problem. 
Um, and it might not always be come out the way that you think. And so the behavioral examples that I give in the sort of transcom, easy pass, whatever, are, are examples of where they're like, this is an inf it's, it's an infrastructure problem to the extent that it is happening and playing out on infrastructure. Cars are on roads, they're on our bridges, they're in our tunnels, buses are in these places. Like, how do we think about this holistically and creatively, I think? Um, and so this was a, a one where it, it's really interesting that they like, they not only built these coalitions and got easy pass transcom and everything done, but like later on, they give them away. Easy pass is not something that the Port Authority runs anymore. Transcom is not something that the Port Authority runs anymore. They sort of like created it, spun it off. Now, the, some of the reasons why it's not, Part of the Port Authority anymore is that uh, cut happy director who is like, get rid of this stuff. Um, but they're, they're also on their own because they were solutions that stood on their own two legs. They didn't actually need a huge organization to be part of it. So I would submit that there, that various, at various points in its, its existence, it hasn't seen infrastructure as like hasn't seen things as a nail, but like is actually capable of sort of lateral thinking on things. Um, the other thing is that one of the huge advantages in the, of the Port Authority is that it can think in terms of systems. It controls roads, rail, port, airport, all that stuff. So it has a really good insight over a vast territory, not the whole region, but like a big chunk of it. And so it has a lot of insight about like what is moving where and why and where we're getting dilemmas. So early on, it, it built and then replaced a bunch of bridges that basically, if you follow them from New Jersey, enable you to go around New York, like around the city, through Staten Island and onto Long Island. So they understood that what was happening was that there was a lot of congestion going on as trucks and various things were trying to get into Manhattan, but a lot of stuff wasn't staying there. It was just passing through on its way to Long Island. Um, if the, it was just an organization that just controlled roads or just did bit bridges, there isn't much that it could have done about that. Um, if it was like just a city agency that was like, well, we're seeing this problem, trucks are coming through here, like what can we do? Um, there are ways to solve that, but they didn't have access to the understanding of the entire network. So what the Port Authority did was it really like pushed these routes, built these networks across Staten Island and said like, here we go. You can go a different direction. And I think that's, again, another example of how an organization like this, that's like got a lot of different feelers and tentacles and stuff out there can understand a region rather than think about them in terms of like little local systems that are all connected to one another. It's like a big picture thing that they can do. And so on those types of things, I'm, I think again, like there's a huge advantage to being able to do that. Um, I'm, I'm not sure, and like Tim, you can maybe maybe clarify this, but like, what would be a, a solution to an infrastructure problem that wouldn't be an infrastructure solution, I guess is, is what I would throw back to you. But I, I think that like the examples I've given show you that they're kind of behavioral solutions, there's other things, but they're using, using kind of lateral thinking on getting around some of the problems. That's what I would say. I don't know if other panelists want to weigh in on that. All right, I'm seeing nobody rush for the unmute buttons, but maybe perhaps there will be uh, for this next prompt. Um, Dave Voller uh, has uh, what he considers to be two random prompts, but um, uh, Dave, do you want to say uh, perhaps uh, uh, leading off with your first part about um, I'm mentioning more scope for work on infrastructure imaginaries and uh, public legitimacy and democratic um, support. What were, you, what were you thinking there? Um, thanks. Uh, and well done, Jen, keeping your voice going this long. Impressive. Um, <laughs> you must be exhausted already. Um, yeah, I, I don't know if this is a very good question. It probably betrays the particular context in Britain. Um, but I just wonder uh, about the extent to which infrastructure can uh, sort of retains its capacity to inspire the public 
and retain political support. Um, I think in Britain we're struggling with some big infrastructure issues, um, but maybe maybe we're a one-off. Um, so I'd just be intrigued to, in your thoughts, Jen, on um, whether whether we're sort of reaching the limits of that. Um, and uh, I, I had a second part to my question, really, on, on the whole sort of infrastructure regionalism um, project, uh, which is which might be a, a completely naive question, but um, you know, was it trying to make us do better? Uh, I think is what's at the heart of my question. So um, yeah, I don't maybe I don't know if that's clearer than what I wrote down or not, but I'll leave I'll leave it with you. Thanks. Yeah, it is. So for those of you who don't, you probably most of you probably don't know this, but Dave and I are working together on a paper for the Oxford to Cambridge Arc, which is an, another infra sort of region um, where infrastructure is. Yeah, it's seen as sort of a, a thing that might be able to bring together various pieces of that are not super well linked with infrastructure. Um, so that that's sort of a background on this comment. And so thanks for, for coming, Dave, and also asking that cool question. So infrastructure is capacity to inspire the public. And I think coming back to this sort of a regional imaginaries and how it affects that. So the story I like to tell is, so I did, taught um, as an adjunct at Hunter College in the planning department for many years. And I taught a course on metropolitan governance and kind of like thinking about the urban region. And I'd always ask my students every year, like what's the New York metropolitan region? Draw me a circle. Show me where, like, what you think it is. So, like, they've never been introduced at metropolitan statistical areas. Some of, well, some of them had, like, so I was just curious, like, why are you drawing a circle that way? And they're like, oh, well, this is because people here are, you know, Yankees fans and the people over there are not. Like, <laughs> there are all sorts of reasons that you give, but the most common one, no matter what class, and I, like, how many times I, I taught it, was that they were like, oh, that's where. The path train ends. That's as far as Metro North goes. That's as far as this name that piece of infrastructure goes. And in a in a in this region, it's very radial, right? So they kind of go out in every direction rather than between one another, um, which is a fun, not uncommon. Um, but yeah, it was basically like it goes it goes as far as this. And like they would sit there and they'd be like, "How far does New Jersey Transit go? Like, where does that? How far can you get on a like?" So is this the answer to your question? I don't know, but like, I think that a lot of people's lived experience and their perception of like what the regional space is that they exist in is shaped by how far can you get easily on transportation? Now in the UK, that's really different because like love the trains there. I'm like the person who takes a train to like from London to Glasgow and thinks that's no big deal. Um, like, I'm just like, what? <laughs> Let's just train everywhere. Um, so if you think about it from that perspective, like every, you can get everywhere. So it's like no big deal. But like from a, from a like commuter rail perspective, like where where would you like to like get on the on a commuter train and like get into this center um, is something that that is is immensely powerful, I think. And that was something too that um, now I'm going to portray how long I've been at this. When I was doing my postdoc in Luxembourg, I was studying cross border metropolitan regions. So these are metropolitan regions that are like that have bits that stick over international boundaries, not just state boundaries. Um, Luxembourg is one of those. Um, but I also studied the Lille um, metropolitan region that kind of blobs into Belgium. And same question there. I'd be like, well, how do you describe this region? And it was always the transportation network. They'd be like, oh, well, you know, it's like over to Kortrijk. You can get that far. You can get to like to here. And they would. And that was it. And, and so as a result, when they were doing region building in Lille, and like this was actually a governance exercise that they did, they infrastructure was central to it because they realized that like what they really wanted was for people to see it like, oh, I can get from here to there, like to live the region rather than to just live in their little piece of it. Um, and so I think uh, that it can be immensely important in shaping perceptions. And so like, in the arc, for instance, if that east-west, when the east-west rail is going, I think that that will be like, there will be a moment where people are like, oh yeah, like we're now, we now have like connection 
between Oxford and Cambridge were like part of the same thing, more in the imaginary sense um, than this like, oh, it's like kind of tricky to drive and like I have to go into London and back out again to get anywhere near there on a train effectively. Um, it, it, it can be incredibly powerful, I think is what my answer is. Michael, you might want to answer this other thing about the, the second part about what we're trying to do better with infrastructural regionalism and noir in general. Oh, I shall. I think it's I think it's more than a normative stance. I think it's a um, I think putting these different um, components that we've outlined together, the intent is for a, a a more nimble framework to answer the the underlying regional question that I think all of us in the room are interested in by bringing um, infrastructure and, and broadly speaking, different infrastructural systems together and thinking about not only the lived experience of individuals and, and communities within a, a regional space, uh, but also thinking about those soft and formal governance relationships at the same time as thinking about the, the spatial imaginaries that are governing and, and uh, modulating regional space. I think that we can get towards a, a better position with which to understand how different um, uh, different policies and intended programs are going to continue shaping uh, regional spaces moving forward. So that's the grand vision. We're not there yet. And so uh, within the RSRS paper, for instance, and the work that we're undergoing at the moment, it's stepping stones to get there. Uh, what we have at the moment is an agenda, but hopefully one that uh, is a little bit more uh, effective than say an RPA, uh, Regional Planning Association paper about what New York should look like in the future but rather it's something that um, is, is helping us understand um, in a number of international contexts, what is occurring and how infrastructure should be uh, considered to be a central part of that equation. That's the part, the potted summary. Um, I would now like to turn back to the panelists as well uh, in re uh, response to Dave's question, uh, but also what, what Jen has been saying. I'm struck by the absence within this within this talk about uh, how how the Port Authority butts up against different sorts of entities with different imaginaries around the region. Because um, from what I understand, the Port Authority's um, uh, regional playground has not shifted over 100 years. It has not uh, redefined the region in terms of its uh, extent. But at the same time, we do have the Regional Plan Association based in New York that thinks very mega regionally about what things uh, should occur. Uh, we've, got, we've got the local metropolitan planning organization as well that has a role in, in transportation planning um, and they have a different geographic footprint. Um, I'm curious about um, what all of our panelists think about um, the way that regional space is constructed and, and how of uh, the narrative that Jen has been putting out today uh, fits with our understanding about uh, the construction of regional space, um, seeing like business, John, maybe, uh, uh, seeing mega regionally markets, perhaps, uh, thinking about how communities uh, uh, really operate within these spaces, uh, Julie. Um, would you all like to reflect on that, that construction of region um, that, that Jen's book uh, opens up? I'm going to call on Julie. Yeah, I'll go. Um, I mean, what, what, what comes to mind, it was, it was really interesting, Jen, what you said about asking your classes about the region and how it coincides with, and again, it's the commuter infrastructure, right? Um, because I'm thinking about, especially in the, the case where, where the ports and the, you know, the, all these different modes are under the one authority, that's not always the case, right? And so the extent to which the infrastructural regional imaginary is going to be different for the port. You know, I'm thinking of someplace like LA Long Beach, where 75% of what comes in goes somewhere else in the country, right? I mean, the, the, the entire continent is the hinterland versus, um, you know, and similarly with airports, their, their region is often quite large. Um, but then the, the physical infrastructure also plays a role, right? Where, where, where it's, it's, the node of a port or an airport that serves a larger region versus the physical network of the rail lines that has a much more spatially delineated location. Um, those are obviously going to lead to different kinds of imaginaries and how people understand what the region is with regards to this mode versus that mode. 
Um, and maybe the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey is kind of unique in having those under one umbrella um, so that, as you said, the like revenue wise, they can balance each other out. But I'm curious too, if, if that makes a difference in how the region's understood um, versus someplace like LA where there are very separate kinds of entities um, or even Boston, um, not too far away where they're, they're much more separated as well. Um, but that, that commuter imaginary versus the, the freight imaginary, for example. Thank you. Uh, John? Thanks, Michael. Um, yeah, just a few reflections. One, actually, just to something Marcus said about kind of the, the larger scale, um, just struck me, there was a, a quote I remember from Stephen Wheeler uh, a few years ago talking about the fact that sort of saying, we can hardly plan at the regional scale, like what chance have we got of doing it at this larger kind of mega region scale? I think that's probably quite apt in some of the discussions we're talking about. Um, an anecdotal one, just reflecting on Jen's comment, I was in a session at the AAG maybe five years ago uh, with John Tomney, Andy Jonas, the people who work in kind of areas around kind of city region, metropolitan governance. And we all sat there at eight o'clock, uh, a typical AAG session, realising that we'd all turned into transport geographers. Um, so I think that gives you a sense that how people are, move, people are interested in governance aspects and regions uh, are all kind of getting to transport and infrastructure. And I know transport and infrastructure are not interchangeable, but I think uh, just an interesting reflection. I've got one comment on the recent imaginaries, and then I've got a question which I suppose is directed towards Jen because of the empirical example. The infrastructure defining regions, I think, is really interesting because the example you used about the Regional Plan Association and, and the example I can think of here is their kind of America 2050 mega region geography. And it's put forward as a mega region imaginary and it's put forward as a, as a, as a kind of uh, a planning imaginary about competitiveness. And yet you go on their website as was, and Jen mentioned interesting kind of trains. Like if you're interested in high-speed trains, that's what you got. The website was just pictures of high-speed trains. And really the question was, is this actually a regional imaginary or are these mega regions being, being mobilised for a purpose which is to try and attract investment into a high-speed rail? So the question for me is, what, who's mobilising these regional imaginaries? And actually quite often, I think they're quite shallow in terms of their, their, their storyboard on which something else is being told. And actually the story is infrastructure and transport. The question of... Just give, maybe give one other example. In the UK, um, the, the Northern Powerhouse, the timing's really interesting because it was just before President Xi from China came across um, trying to um, persuade the Chinese to invest in high-speed rail in the UK. They launched a region, the imaginary, in effect, at this scale all around infrastructure. And yet the spatial aspect's interesting because when one of the government ministers who would put in charge of this was asked, where is the Northern Powerhouse? They said, it's wherever you want it to be. And in effect, what you get is a map with some train lines and some infrastructure, but they won't actually define the region. So I think that that tension is, is very, very um, central to a lot of these debates. And it's interesting that Noir's picking this up and, and, and running with it. My question to Jen specifically is, talking about the Port Authority, and I think there was a mention about City Hall and a few other things. Personnel, and we talked about particular men and male kind of figures within this, but I wonder just below that a little bit, probably still is white men, but have you picked up other examples of people who've moved between the institutions? So my, my research that I've done, quite often the, the big infrastructure developers, um, they move from being a, a prominent person within that, the board of directors, and they move to the, the, the state, um, in this case, maybe City Hall or even to the airport group. And then there's almost this, this cadre of people who move between them to try and exact their influence. Um, so they, they might be at the Port Authority, but then they might go to work at the airport group, but they're still working in effect for the Port Authority. Do you get any of that sort of sense going on with the Port Authority in, in New York? Um, so, yeah, a few reflections and one question that came up that I think might be interesting just to reflect on. Thanks. Let's gather uh, Marcus's uh, reflections as well and then uh, come back to you, Jen, for, for both that and then um, uh, Theodora's question as well, still in the chat. Yeah, I'm happy to leave uh, 
time to Jen for answering their questions. Just sharing one impression that I have, uh, looking at this uh, no teeth um, issue of uh, the declining power of the Port Authority, if today, if there would be no Port Authority, there's probably also in the New York, New, uh, New Jersey region, uh, a, a huge call for integration, for regional integration. And if it would not exist, there would probably be a call for let's build at least one agency that is in charge of all these nodal and, and, and key pieces of infrastructure so that, that this goes on with regional management. Now we have that, but in, in uh, historical terms, it lost power. So this is a depressing outlook actually for, well, who actually could take over this, uh, this kind of regional integration but maybe uh, you have a, a, a better, uh, more positive, constructive outlook uh, also for that, um, for that problem. All right, yeah, yes and no. I'm gonna start with Marcus there with that one. Um, yes and no. So the, the as, as terms of, in terms of being like optimistic about things, if the Port Authority stopped existing today, I don't think anyone would try and bring everything together. I just like can't see it happening. Now, so, and th this will kind of speak a little bit to Michael's observation too, which is that the Port Authority's region hasn't changed much since, like it's, it's like got a little bit of pieces like here and there that are like not in that region and that's not really that important, but like where it focuses is very much on the like, core of the Metro region and doesn't, doesn't really at least control things outside of that. Um, in the past, so and he mentioned formal things like the MPOs, the Metropolitan Planning Organizations. Um, in the past, there was a single unified Metropolitan Planning Organization, briefly, that fell apart um, and was broken up into three different MPOs, and that still exists to this day. There have been attempts to try and harmonize things, to like do cross-border things from a, in the horizontal governance perspective that have all failed massively, at least on the like building a transportation authority for it. So um, that's a really important context and one where I feel like we're never gonna get an overarching thing. And, and even right now, even with the Port Authority that has airports, bridges, tunnels, port, um, and, and various other pieces of infrastructure, they're, they don't control everything. Um, the MTA exists separate from that. So that controls the buses and, and um, subways in New York and on Long Island um, and up into Westchester. New Jersey Transit exists by itself. There are two different highway authorities, New Jersey and New York, that do things separately. There are two different highway policing kind of things that exist. <laughs> Their path train is the only commuter train that they run, and it's a very small system, relatively speaking. Um, so there's just so much fragmentation, even though the Port Authority exists, um, that it is, it's sort of mind boggling. Um, and it just like the, and I think this speaks to your earlier point, Marcus, where you're like, is this just too big of a thing <laughs> to, to like, wrap your head around and the answer is absolutely yes of course yes there's like there is not a way i don't think to to rearrange this in an institutionally neat and tidy way um it's certainly not one that would be politically palatable to anyone i don't think and and so that's another reason why i mean and, with, and so my book on regos the regional intergovernmental organizations no regos in new york <laughs> zero it's like the biggest, most complicated place, there is no Rigo. Like, and we have a specific definition for what that is. Lots of regional organizations, nothing that fits our definition. Um, and so uh, that is significant. That's super significant. And understanding why that didn't happen, um, that never happened even in like an informal way um, is interesting. The regional plan association is the exception. This is a business led effort. It is not a government-led effort. It is does it has you know local governments are members or whatever, but it's a predominantly private sector visioning exercise, um, and that's why they're able to sort of think mega regionally. They can put grand plans in place, and their power is soft. Some things have happened that were in regional plans, but they've always had to be kind of negotiated 
and convinced with the individual actors that were needed to put that into place. Um, so this really does come back to some of the questions about regional imaginaries and where they come from and like what they're for, right? I don't think New York has one that's coherent. When I say that the, my story of like the regional imaginary from the student's perspective, the, the one that dominates is where how far the rail goes. Um, it's not the only one. And so when I think of regional imaginaries on one level, it's they're constructed from below. It's like, where do you feel like your region is? So if that was sort of the lens that I was looking at it. And I agree with you, John, that the whenever somebody says, this is the region and we need to think at this scale, you have to be a little bit skeptical as to like, why that region? Because as regional scholars, we all know that our regions are in the process of changing. Um, sorry, my dog's back there. Um, <clears throat> regions are in the constant change and flux and like you draw a boundary one day, tomorrow it is no longer relevant. Um, and institutional inertia is a factor. Um, so yeah, it's just, yeah, there isn't a regional imaginary for New York uh, in, a, in, like, in the sense that like anyone has set, set that up in a convincing and well bought into way. The Regional Plan Association is probably the only one. And I don't even think that the Port Authority would claim to be speaking for the entire region, even though they convene at that level all the time, um, their definition of what that is is very flexible and project specific, if that Thanks, makes man. sense. We've got about uh, four minutes to go before we need to wrap up. And there's two questions that I'd like to get to before that. And you touched on uh, Theodora's a little in, in the answer that you just provided. And uh, hers is really, a, 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 I'm taking as a lessons learned um, um, question related to the kind of informal institutions that you think could increase the synergies between actors involved in various points on regional local infrastructure agendas uh, in a region where devolution is low and that there is institutional fragmentation. So what are the best practices there that you've seen from uh, points where the Port Authority has been really successful? I really wish that I had a good answer to this. If I did, I feel like I'd be running a consulting business and like raking it in, right? But I'm like, it's so contextual, so contextually specific, right? Um, I've, I think that it's less what does the institution look like and more what the idea is. You need people to buy into an idea. And I don't, I don't know that imaginary is necessarily the right word, um, but, but that comes into it. You need to, people to buy into an idea and a scale um, at which they're operating that. This is really, I feel like this is really unsatisfying. I'm really sorry. Um, sometimes that happens around crisis, right? There's a crisis. People are like, God, we gotta solve this. Like, we're just gonna have to like leave our check, our egos at the door and deal with it. Um, crisis is a huge motivator and it brings people together in fragmented regions. Now you don't always want a crisis. That's not a good thing. <laughs> but it can it can really help. Um, the other thing is is a, a shared objective and opportunity. So it, one of the things that I've done in my thesis, wow, we're going back in the archives now. Um, I studied uh, regional governance in Toronto and Frankfurt, two big cities, big city regions, um, but also Waterloo, Ontario, which is a little bit down the road from Toronto, and the uh, uh, Rhine Neckar region, which is a, like Heidelberg's in there, which is a bit down the road from Frankfurt. And lo and behold, regional governance and civic capital that I talk about a bunch um, was stronger in these smaller areas. And that was because they had a common enemy and goal, right? They were not Toronto, they were not Frankfurt, but they needed to scrabble and scrap uh, anyway. Um, and so that really brought people together to be like, no, no, we, we can like create an identity and solve this problem and be competitive um, on our own merits by like building this identity. And it really was like something that brought lots of people together. So I, I've written about myth making in the Waterloo way. There's, there's, it creates all sorts of stories that people latch onto that then all of a sudden are just like the stories that they go with. Um, and those things are then what makes communities come together and be like, yeah, let's let's just work across you know jurisdictional boundaries and make make this crazy infrastructure line work in this area. Um, it's a real catalyst for stuff like that. Um, so I yeah, I I'm not I'm not sure that's an institutional perspective. I think my point is overall that the institutions matter, but they don't matter 
like what you need is the reason, the idea, the sort of like motive force to like get everyone to talk and act. Well, thanks. I, I think that's a, a great point uh, with which to leave things. I'd like to thank our panelists, John Harrison, Julie Sedell, and Marcus Hess, as well as, of course, uh, uh, Jen Nellis for, uh, for giving us such a provocative uh, session here at the Regions in Recovery uh, Festival. I really appreciated your remarks. Jen, I feel like we should work together on something at some point. So, Oh, yeah, yeah, that. let's do it. All right. For all of you, uh, have a great evening, morning, um, or, or afternoon, wherever you are. Thanks so much for your participation today, and uh, uh, enjoy your weekend. Thank you.